So my name is Elliot Moss. I'm a professor in the College of Information and Computer Sciences and current co-director of graduate programs. The other co-director is Professor Andrew McGregor. Uh, he's kind of shadowing me this semester to learn the ropes, so to speak, of the job, and he'll be taking over as of uh, 2021. Um, and I have been um, in the college since 1985 and doing this work since I think 2014, something like that. Um, and you know, we do rotate these sorts of responsibilities from time to time. So this is a kind of a natural handover to Andrew. Um, it also turns out that I'm formally retiring, but I'm sticking around and doing stuff for the college anyway. Um, we have also uh, a director of the MS program, Professor Mark Corner. Uh, he won't be here. This orientation is for PhD track students. Our graduate programs manager is Eileen Hamill. You want to say anything, Eileen? Sure. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to see so many of you here today from around the world and in Amherst or locally. It's, it's really great to have you here so you can ask Elliot all your important questions. And if you forget to ask a question or you, or you think of something after this event, you can um, certainly meet with me and uh, uh, next week for the PhD Q&A. So happy to answer right. any questions as a follow-up. Right, or, uh, or email either of us and so forth. Um, I wanna suggest a protocol for the meeting since we're gonna have 30 odd people here. It's probably best if you keep uh, muted unless you have a question or something. Um, we, why don't we start with the idea that you can just ask a question by unmuting and kind of jumping in. It'll be a little bit informal that way. Um, if you prefer to ask a question on chat, you can do that. And Eileen, if you're willing uh, to keep an eye on the chat, since I'll be uh, sharing screen, I won't be able to look at the chat so well. Um, and then you could also jump in and say, hey, there's a question or whatever. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Well, again, uh, welcome to everyone. We're glad you're uh, with us uh, in spirit anyway. Uh, you may or may not be in Amherst, but you're now part of our program and we're really glad you're here. Um, and the purpose of today's orientation is to begin to answer your questions about how the graduate program works, uh, what the steps are to go through and obtain a PhD and so forth. Uh, so I've got a presentation, I'm gonna go through some slides I'll start to share in a minute and they'll be posted. And of course, this is being recorded so that you can look at it again later or people who couldn't come can also watch it. Uh, oh, um, I need the host to enable my screen share. Thank you. And go over to the slide stack. So is that visible now? Eileen, can you see the slides? Yeah. Yep. Great. There you go. Okay. So uh, I have this nice uh, picture of our building. If you haven't been physically present uh, there, um, and uh, Eileen and Malika's office, you would go through this door and through the uh, atrium, and it would be on the right. And my office is right about here. Not that it matters. Uh, usually uh, the uh, staff are your first line of defense. And of course, right now we're not really meeting in person anyway. Right, so uh, the portions or organization of this slide stack, uh, I'll talk some about the program requirements, a bit about uh, research, classes, community and self-care, um, and a little bit of general things. And I invite you to jump in and ask questions at uh, any time. Okay, let's get started. Now, 
I just wanted to point out some recent interesting or important research from CICS. Um, there's lots of other great stuff going on too. These aren't the only things, of course, but Professor Philippa Gill, pictured at the top, uh, does work on censorship tracking. Uh, there's some other folks who do similar things. Professor Brendan O'Connor here um, looks at diversity in online language analysis. Uh, one of his students has looked at differences between uh, tweets written by African Americans, say, versus other people, and can you identify people from their, well, the ethnicity or background of people from their use of language, and what might that imply? Um, Professor Gannison here, uh, has been looking at how to extend the battery life of mobile health devices so you don't have to recharge them so often. And then these two fellows, uh, Sunghoon Ivan Lee and Tawardur Rahman, uh, have been working uh, most recently on wearable sensors and COVID symptom tracking. So this has gotten some uh, reporting in the news, in the press. Uh, so we've got a lot of people doing interesting and relevant things. Now, a key thing we want you to do is get involved in research early in your program. Um, some students, I think, have a notion of, oh, well, I'll do all my classwork and then I'll do my research. That's not the model we want you to follow. We want you to be involved in research from the beginning. Uh, of course, the manner in which you're doing it as you're just starting out as a young researcher uh, may be a little different from what you'll be doing toward the end of your PhD program. But the sooner you get involved, the sooner you can start to grow as a researcher. And that research is going to be needed to uh, help you do your master's in synthesis projects. It'll obviously be needed for your dissertation. It's related to getting uh, research assistant funding. And overall, if we had to put a number on it, we'd say it's 80% of getting your PhD. There are classes and other things, but the research is the key component. Uh, now, if you aren't already affiliated with a professor in a research group, uh, here are some suggestions for uh, how to find a research group you might want to affiliate with. Uh, obviously, think about your interests, read more uh, about them, talk with various people, uh, other students, our faculty, visiting speakers. There'll be opportunities for that. I know that you know, while we're still in COVID, some of that talking to people might be a little harder to arrange than usual, but I urge you to um, have persistence to pursue it. Uh, attend seminars and talks and such. One of the great uh, opportunities of this time of pursuing a PhD is all the visitors and talks and seminars that you can experience very easily because they come to us and you don't have to seek them out. And I urge you to do that across a broad range of topics, not just your narrow focus area. This is an opportunity we can learn a lot about a lot of different things that are going on in computer science. Now, uh, we want all our PhD students affiliated with a professor and a lab by next summer if they're not already affiliated. And we stand here ready to help you do that. Now, you will be assigned a temporary advisor if you do not have a permanent research advisor. Your job and the job of the temporary advisor is to help you find that more permanent research advisor uh, in this first year. Now, our practice is students can switch advisors and research groups at any time. Of course, the advisor taking you on, uh, the group you may be joining need to be willing to receive you but um, there's no harm, no foul in switching. Uh, so if you're affiliated, it's not like a marriage that requires some kind of formal divorce or something to change things around. Um, as a courtesy, politeness, obviously you should let the professor that you're moving away from know about that. And it's always best not to leave a mess behind you in terms of unfinished pieces of work if that can be avoided. Uh, now, most of our PhD students are funded as research assistants, RAs, in their research group. 
Uh, but a uh, number are funded as teaching assistants. Uh, not all groups can fund all the research they do. Uh, I'm in that boat, for example. So I have, what is it now, four or five students working with me, of whom two are currently funded. Uh, no, I'm sorry, three. Uh, so about half. Um, and the others uh, are working many of their semesters as teaching assistants. We do not view those as students as second class citizens and their labor is highly valued in our instructional programs. Right now, as I said, you've been assigned an advisor. Now you may have affiliated with someone who has taken you on as their PhD student. That's wonderful if that's true. Uh, some of you uh, may not uh, be affiliated at the beginning and you have a temporary advisor. So I've mentioned this already. Okay. So for the first few years, um, well, even the whole program, you'll be focusing on research and getting your master's degree, uh, which involves taking courses and doing an MS project and such. And concurrently with that, preparing what we call a portfolio, which I'll get into in more detail in a minute, but it's our version of the exam uh, for you to be ready to do your dissertation. And then once you have submitted your portfolio successfully and been approved as what we call a candidate for the PhD, then you work on your dissertation, write your thesis and turn it in, find a job. And we hope there's a lot of fun along the way. And this can be a fun uh, place to be, a fun part of the world to be, uh, especially when we're not quite so locked down. Now about the coursework, uh, we have a notion of core courses. They somewhat fall into three groups, or at least there are three areas in which we require you to take courses. Uh, we call them systems, theory, and AI, artificial intelligence. And the goal there is to have some breadth, a bit of comprehensive mastery of the subject matter of computer science. Computer science is big enough um, you won't all be expert in all of computer science, of course, but we want you to know more than, say, just machine learning or just operating systems. Uh, we put a link embedded here uh, where you can go look at all the detailed requirements, but I'll now, now walk through a few of them. So on the MS PhD track, you'll need to do 30 credits in total uh, typical classes are worth three credits, so that's about 10 courses. Of these, six core courses need to have a grade of B plus or better. And I would just say in a graduate program, uh, a grade below B is considered more or less failing in the PhD program, but the core courses require a B plus. Now of those six, you need one from each of those core areas, systems, theory, and AI. So each one of those areas has a short list of courses. Well, I say short, the systems list is kind of long, but AI and theory have just two courses on their list. So you do one of those two courses in theory, one of those two courses in AI, and then a systems uh, course, plus three others, uh, essentially any of our graduate courses that are more uh, lecture style. And then you also do six credits of master's project, which we'll talk about. Okay, now a few of you may be admitted PhD only, that is we were able to recognize your master's degree uh, and say, okay, you need only to do the PhD. So your total number of course credits required is less, but you still need to do the six core courses and fulfill that portfolio requirement. Now, <clears throat> if you have already done a suitable course in, let's say, machine learning, uh, we can uh, allow you to waive our machine learning course and say, okay, you have completed that core requirement. This does not give you the three credits, but we don't want you to repeat work that you've already done at the graduate level uh, that's comparable. 
Uh, now, if you're going to request any waivers, we, we ask that you fill in the waiver form for all the courses you're requesting uh, at once and uh, list all the courses you've already taken, the ones you want to waive, the courses you plan to take. So we understand your complete plan for the core courses and uh, provide one copy for each course you wish to waive. Um, and you can work with uh, Eileen or Malika on that. And then our instructors will review the waiver request. Usually they want to see some syllabus information about the previous course. And then they'll make a recommendation either no, uh, that isn't close enough to our course to waive it. Uh, partial waiver, meaning yes, it's close enough, but I'd like to see you, the student take a course here uh, in the same general topic area. Or third possibility is unconditional waiver. Yes, that's fine. Uh, the graduate program director has the final say over the whole collection of waivers. I would just say I prefer not to see uh, a whole area of study waived here, I'd like you to see uh, things across a range of our faculty. And again, waiving is not the same thing as giving you transfer transcript credits. It is possible to transfer up to six credits um, they have to be from uh, recognized U.S. university. This isn't our rule, it's the graduate school rule. And you cannot have used them toward another degree. And they have to be at the graduate level. Um, so sometimes that'll help reduce the number of courses you need to take here. Okay, and there are forms for doing the waiver. Okay, uh, stepping back from some of those details. Uh, now, in terms of doing your coursework, again, the model is not let's do all my courses and then do research. We want you to spread the coursework out some. Our core courses are work intensive. And if you're new to graduate study, uh, the rule of thumb that I usually give students is a graduate course will typically take twice the work of an undergraduate course. So as an undergraduate, you might have taken four, five, six courses that's nearly impossible to do as a graduate student, especially if you're doing research or being a TA at the same time. Um, so one core course, maybe one other course per semester is appropriate for a PhD track student. Now, don't worry about the notion of how many credits you need to be full time, especially you international students. We realize that you will have TA or RA duties that you're engaged in research. So uh, even if you're taking, say, three credits of courses, we will still certify you as a full-time student, and that's not a problem. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna pause there just a second and see what questions might be arising before diving into the portfolio. Eileen, do we have any questions in chat? No, no questions. Not yet. yet. All right. Uh, my concern, students, is uh, you know, I, I can't see you or anything. Uh, so I'm going through this talk, you might say, almost on autopilot. And I, you know, I may just go through things too quickly. So if there's anything you want to know more about, you know, please jump in, let me know. Okay, I'm going to uh, go ahead and talk about the portfolio then. Right, so most PhD programs uh, I'm aware of have some kind of examination that you have to pass to uh, be allowed to pursue your, your PhD level work. We used to do that when I was a brand new faculty member here, but within my first 10 years, which uh, might have been <laughs> at this point before some of you were born, uh, we found that wasn't really working for us. And so we replaced it with a portfolio system uh, because we found we wanted to do a more holistic review of a student's readiness to do PhD research. So the requirements of the portfolio of what you present is you need at least four of your six core courses completed and you need at least one 
core in each of the three areas completed. You're going to need three recommendations from CICS faculty. We have a recommendation form they fill out. And you need to do a synthesis research project, which I'll talk more about on another slide. Uh, almost all students who come up in PASS portfolio have at least submitted work for publication in conferences, workshops, or journals. Publications are valuable. They're not absolutely required. But if you've never attempted a publication, uh, in my experience, the, the faculty may uh, impose other requirements on you or may kind of say uh, no. Um, so it is important to be developing your skill in research toward the idea of submitting work for publication. That is a key piece of evidence that you're ready to do PhD level work. Now, the synthesis project. This is a unique thing uh, to our program. Uh, I don't know any other program that has it. And the idea of it is it's uh, usually a two semester long project. And it's gonna synthesize two different areas of computer science. And when we say different, uh, it means at least something along the lines of the, the areas normally publish in different places. When I say different areas of computer science, sometimes it might be, say, computer science and linguistics or something like that, and that's okay as well. Um, so this will normally be supervised by two CICS faculty members. That we call the first reader and the second reader. Usually that first reader will be your research advisor. The second reader can be someone outside CICS but the first reader must be within our college. And occasionally we'll see a third reader, which is also okay, though it, it's a little unusual. You might have two faculty in CICS and then a third person in another uh, discipline or another institution. Now I want to emphasize, don't get behind on getting ready for the synthesis project. It is the most common reason that people's portfolio and whole program is delayed. You have to have this project done um, and the report done as part of the portfolio. And it takes generally two semesters at least to do. And you have to be ready to do it and then line up the two faculty members. So keep it in mind. It's not something you need to do your first semester or your first year, but don't let it slide. Um, as I say, it's the most common reason people get behind. Okay, now I mentioned before, and then I just talked about, uh, I mentioned before the MS project, and I just talked about the synthesis project. The MS project is also a two semester project, also has two readers. Well, so what's different? What's going on here? How do these relate? Well, most PhD track students combine the two, which we allow. The synthesis project uh, is contributing to evidence of your ability and accomplishment in research. Uh, and that's why it's part of the portfolio. It is not a course by itself. It doesn't carry credit. It's just something you have to do. The MS project, on the other hand, is a course number 701. And you can combine it with the synthesis project in order to obtain credit. And that's the most common thing you do. Uh, you do three credits in one semester, three credits in, in, in the next semester. Occasionally we see students do it as six credits in one semester if they're really, really ready to go and uh, don't have a lot of other things they have to be doing at the same time. Now a PhD only student doesn't need to do the MS project. They can do just the synthesis project. Now that would mean they don't get credit but we're willing to grant independent study credit um, if uh, folks want to work it out that way. Okay, so this leads to a typical schedule, uh, or you might say a, a canonical schedule for an MSPhD track student of taking one core course per semester. You'll see here, let's see if I can get my mouse to work without advancing the screen. There we go one core course in each of the first six semesters and maybe some non-core work. We want you in a research group within the first two semesters. 
Normally you would propose your synthesis project in the fourth semester and complete it in the fifth. It's fine to do it earlier. Um, it can be challenging to try to do it in your first year unless you have already had a lot of involvement in the research. Um, and so your standard deadline to submit your portfolio is your fifth semester as a student. And that's submitted, uh, well, if it was a fall submission, is around November 1st, the spring submission around April 1st. So it's somewhat before the end of the semester. You might want to have that in mind. Right. Um, and then uh, let's assume you submit your portfolio, you pass the portfolio, then you still have the one more core course to do in your sixth semester. You do that, and then you become a candidate for the PhD. And being a candidate means you are now allowed to form a committee and propose a dissertation, something we hope happens about a, you know, within about a year after the portfolio, so maybe your seventh semester or so. And your MS requirements would have been completed probably in your sixth semester, something like that. After that, you may just do dissertation credits, which frankly are nearly meaningless. Uh, you do your research, you publish, you write your dissertation, and you defend it. And a typical period of time with us is between four and a half and six years from entry to completion. Uh, some students do slightly faster, occasional students take longer. Um, let's see. I've seen a few chat things there. Eileen, do we have questions? Nope, they've already been answered. Oh, I see, okay. Mm -hmm. um, now I'll just mention uh, just a quick little thing, these dissertation credits sitting here. There's a, a campus technical requirement. Uh, it's called the residency requirement that you have to have two semesters, one after the other, uh, where you have nine credits in each of those semesters. Uh, our PhD track students commonly fulfill that with two consecutive semesters of nine credits each of dissertation credits, because you have to have a total of 18 dissertation credits. As I say, you'd be working on your dissertation anyway. The credits are pretty meaningless, and uh, they get a grade of pass when your dissertation is accepted. So it just doesn't really mean much of anything, but uh, they have to be there and you have this residency requirement. Another requirement along the way, uh, you need to TA at least one semester, unless you can show us that you've done um, uh, real TA work. And by TA, we mean not just grading papers, but some responsibility for uh, like leading discussions or preparing materials. Um, I'm trying to remember, uh, well, and if you TA, you need the 890T course. Uh, we may uh, be imposing an ethics course requirement at some point. Okay, now a PhD only student, this schedule is accelerated uh, by one semester approximately because the number of credits you need to take is less and you've already done your master's work. It's not dramatically accelerated usually. Occasionally students do, do it somewhat faster, but uh, it's typically not that different actually because you need to get used to our faculty. You need to fulfill our core requirements. Okay. Now, MSPhD students who actually have a solid MS degree in computer science, but one that maybe wasn't from a US institution may be eligible to switch to PhD only. Uh, so the graduate program committee would review that and uh, decide. So if it's something you're interested in, we ask you to wait one semester and then fill the form in. Waiting the one semester at the least gives us an opportunity to see how well you're doing in our coursework. Um, but we are uh, willing to uh, allow students to switch programs like that. You will also see, though, the cohort I'm talking to right now are students who are on the PhD track. We do see some students who are in the MS only track and then apply to move to the MS PhD track. Um, I've been working with uh, at least a couple of students who are in that boat. Okay, so uh, here's a silly little joke from PhD comics. 
what it's like to get a PhD. Um, so you can read the graph yourself and see uh, what kind of uh, humor is involved. I will say that uh, one thing that does tend to happen as you uh, move beyond, you know, as you master and then move beyond the body of known knowledge, your notion of how much is known and how much is unknown will shift. Uh, you will begin to realize how much more is unknown than is known. Uh, anyway. Elliot, we have a couple questions. Oh, great. Great. So uh, let me um, just go back. Yeah. Can, can we take independent studies instead of a non-core courses? Um, yes. Uh, <clears throat> you can uh, have up to two courses, six credits of independent study as part of your non-core courses. And the non-core courses can also include seminars, ethics courses, things like that, I believe. Well, uh, no, wait, just a second. Uh, no, I think you can include the ethics courses as well. Um, we do um, have a limit on the total number of credits that can be taken pass fail plus independent study of six credits. But uh, yeah, we, uh, independent study can be part of that 30 credits for your MS degree. It won't help the PhD students really. They, they need 18 credits and uh, those would generally be their core courses. I suppose if they waive some courses, they might be able to use independent study to get the credits they need. Uh, one other question. As yep. an MS, as a master's student only, switching to MS PhD, does our timeline reset as a new master's PhD student? Terrific question. Yes, your timeline resets. And when is our portfolio due? Well, your portfolio would be due your fifth semester at, on the PhD track. Your fifth semester. So if this is, if this fall is your first semester on the PhD track, then your portfolio isn't due until fall of 2022. That's it. Yeah, great, wonderful questions. Okay, we wanna get all the questions answered. Um, I just wanna say a word about academic honesty. Um, as people come from lots of different backgrounds and cultures, uh, especially at the graduate level and the PhD level, we expect uh, honesty in all your work. Uh, and it's critical in research that everything you write and present must either be your own work or your named collaborators or appropriately cited. Uh, and this is a way in which people can get into um, big trouble and possibly ruin their careers. Uh, cheating and plagiarism uh, really won't be tolerated. Um, we all trade on our reputation. Uh, it's all about reputation uh, in your work. And uh, is that work sound? Is it interesting? Is it correct? Um, and so forth. And the university has policies around academic honesty and also research misconduct. And if you're an RA, then the funding agency also will have rules around research ethics and misconduct. So just something to be aware of, uh, particularly around citation and authorship and so forth on papers. It's always better to have that discussion up front than to have a mess after. Okay, and we're happy to uh, try to answer any questions about that. And we'll say things like authorship or order of author names on papers and such varies by specialty. Now, another thing, um, as you move into becoming a graduate student and uh, you know, ultimately a PhD professional, almost all of you are now employees. So both as students and employees, uh, we expect professional behavior. Uh, and we expect that you are now mature adults. We might not always be able to assume that 100% of undergraduates, I'm not disparaging undergraduates, but they are a little younger, but we expect you to behave to a high standard. We are working very actively on an inclusive college climate. 
We want everyone to feel and be safe and welcome. Um, so there's to be no discrimination or harassment, threats, I would say even jokes based on membership or perceived membership in different groups. Uh, have it to do with race or gender identity or expression or sexual orientation or where you came from or disability, whatever. Also, if anything or anyone is making you uncomfortable, we want to know about it. We have two uh, directors of diversity who focus on slightly different aspects of our college life, but either one of them, um, Erica, um, oh gosh, Eileen, in the moment, I'm spacing on names. I'm not great at names. Dawson Head. Thank you, Erica Dawson Head and Emma Anderson. Some of you may have already had dealings with uh, Emma Anderson um, she works on um, student success and is concerned with uh, diversity in that context and also does our TA assignments. Uh, so I or my successor, Andrew McGregor, uh, are also go-to people to help you navigate any of this and resolve any concerns. But of course, uh, you've got Eileen and Malika and Emma and Erica in our diversity office if you have concerns. Okay. Now, I've said a lot to say, go do research, say, go take your classes, but uh, this isn't all uh, work, work, work. Uh, you can't really do this alone. Doing PhD is a challenging thing. We encourage you to connect with other students, with the staff, with faculty. Um, we have all the requirements on the website, and if they're not clear, you can always ask us, and you know, we keep continually refining the website to make things more clear. Uh, we have professionalism seminars to help you learn about various things. And something to note, when we want to get a message out to you, either individually or uh, as a group, we will send to your email address. So make sure that your CICS and your UMass email addresses go to a place that you actually look at. Um, and when we have paper documents, and once you're able to come to the building, that might not be for some months yet, uh, you will have an individual uh, mailbox near the uh, computer science computing facility and dean's office area where we will put papers. Um, so if you're wondering, uh, you know, where is thus and such document? Uh, these days, we try to make it, them mostly electronic, but where is thus and such paper document? That's where it might be. I, I had a student who was like two years in the program and didn't realize he had a mailbox. So I'm trying to fix that. You should know you have a mailbox. Uh, though, of course, you won't be using it just yet. Uh, let's see, what else? Ah, now, PhD level work and doing research is different from probably almost anything else you've done as a student in your whole life. Until now, the good student model will have worked. Now, by that I mean, you sign up for the course, you go to the lectures, you do what the instructor says, you know, do the readings, do the homeworks, whatever, you get the A or whatever grade and you go on to the next course. It's all laid out for you. Research is just not like that. So in the good student model, um, you're used to success, right, by and large, um, if you're uh, a good student. Research isn't like that. You can be an excellent researcher and you still are gonna fail at least 50% of the time in almost every aspect of what you do. Your experiments are gonna fail. Your ideas are gonna fail. Your papers are gonna be turned down. Your grant proposals are gonna be declined. The average grant proposal acceptance rate in, uh, at the National Science Foundation is somewhere between 10 and 20%. We consider a conference to be a strong conference if it accepts no more than 20 to 25% of the submissions. If it accepts more than one third, uh, we don't consider it to be particularly significant in terms of its selectivity it may still be interesting in terms of the community it brings together. So this sort of failure, if you wanna call it failure, happens all the time to the most successful researchers. 
you have to have some resilience, some emotional resilience and some persistence. And I admit, it's not always easy to know when to give up on an idea and when to keep refining it. Uh, lots of times a paper that is turned down or a grant proposal that's declined, you can rework and eventually get it accepted. Um, so you need to look at the, at the reviews and fix things up. But my point is that emotionally, this is going to be different. And for you to be prepared for it and to have a support community to help support you in it. Right. So you need to develop resilience and you need the ability to learn from your regular failures. So I get a grant proposal turned down. I might get, oh, I don't know, slightly angry or depressed for about a day. And then I open up the reviews and start looking at them and trying to, to see, okay, where are my ideas flawed? Where did I not explain them adequately and so forth? How can I do this better uh, next time? And sometimes to ask the question, do I really need a different or better idea? Okay. Now, so some stages of this whole process of getting a PhD will be challenging. I myself remember, and we're talking now 40 years ago, I still remember that feeling for like two years that I was wandering in a featureless swamp because I didn't have a PhD topic. I didn't, couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. So there's, uh, this can happen at the stage of finding the research area or group or topic that really clicks for you and your advisor. Connecting with and working with an advisor. And I'll just note, clear communication in both directions is key. You are the advisee in the relationship, so respect is important, of course, but you need to be able to be, you need the courage to be honest if the relationship isn't working and to try to tell a professor respectfully uh, how they can better serve you if the relationship isn't working. You're gonna to need to learn how to do research in your area. You may need to get more background knowledge, learn more tools, learn the methodology of the area <clears throat> and so forth. And um, just developing ideas can be challenging. Something you do in conjunction with your advisor uh, to lead to papers and ultimately finding that dissertation topic, which was a thing where I was in the swamp. And then I'll say it was almost magical. One day my advisor made an offhand remark of, well, what about this? And I had a signed thesis 15 months later. You just never know. All right. Now, another myth about the PhD is that you're the one who are gonna, who is gonna come up with and supply all of the ideas. An idea might come from your advisor. It did in my case. And uh, I think I had you know, at least an average thesis in the end. It's okay if the spark of the idea comes from somewhere else, as long as you're not taking someone else's idea without permission. You will come to own that idea by your hard work. You know, ideas are cheap. Proved ideas are not. So going out and saying, oh, does this really work and so forth, that's a whole big deal. So working with your advisor is kind of a dance between your ideas and your growing skill level as a researcher, and then the advisor's ideas and knowledge and advice and guidance. Uh, now, eventually you're going to have to be able to generate your own ideas, but you don't have to be able to generate, all the ideas you generate as a graduate student don't have to be all your own. Um, also note that your funded research assistant work has to connect with the project goals that were proposed by the advisor and that were funded by the funding agency. Um, I have had some students who say, well, I've got this wonderful idea. I'm very energized about it. I want to go do it. And I'll say, okay, but that doesn't line up with any of my grants. So I can't give you an RA to work on that. And sometimes I've had to say, well, that sounds like a cool idea. It's outside my expertise. You know, I'm willing to be your advisor, but I'm not sure how good an advisor I can be for that idea. Um, so it really depends. Um, Obviously, this is going to work best if there's kind of an interplay, some give and take between the student and the advisor. Okay. Another uh, occasional misapprehension that I'd like to correct is 
we do not operate on the what I think of as the British or European model that I've seen in uh, British uh, graduate programs and in Australian graduate programs, among others. You satisfy your thesis committee with your dissertation, not some anonymous external reviewer. We don't do anonymous external review of dissertations. You engage your committee throughout the process. You don't just go off in a corner for some number of months or even years and plop down a finished dissertation and say, please grade it. Achieving a PhD, <clears throat> in our model anyway, it's an apprenticeship. So you're learning a trade, if you will, and that trade is research. The dissertation is the thing that demonstrates your ability to do novel research to scientific standard. And then it's also key leverage, of course, to employment and your future research career. So the significance of the work needs to suit those goals. But uh, you know, the theses vary a lot in their significance and not uh, every one needs to be a landmark, uh, just needs to do the job. Okay, let's see. Ah, now some of you, uh, may ha already have excellent research writing skills. Um, in my experience, most students coming in do not. Um, and that's something that you will develop and grow through your program. We now have established in the last handful of years, a writing center with some great uh, faculty and staff who are really excited to help you improve your skills in writing up research. And uh, they gave me a couple of slides that I'm gonna um, show. I'm not gonna go through every detail, but I'm gonna put them up for a minute and talk to a few points. Okay, so a um, couple of people involved in the Writing Center uh, are Justin O'Bara. Uh, his title is lecturer. That means, uh, in fact, Siobhan May is also a lecturer. They are um, faculty with us and we value their presence. Um, and you see that Justin has a background in rhetoric and composition, and Siobhan is a candidate in uh, comparative literature here at UMass. They want to help with a whole range of different kinds of writing, help you with uh, a conference paper or journal paper, uh, things like grant proposals, fellowship applications, statements of purpose, all that kind of thing. Even your resume, I'm sure they could help you with. And they can help anywhere in the writing process, the early part, helping brainstorm ideas and develop into a proposal, uh, uh, some of the conduct of research, uh, revising uh, your writing for different audiences, uh, working on grammar and mechanics and doing academic writing in English. Um, and God bless those of you who are here and are not native English speakers. Uh, you know, I had the good luck, the good fortune to be working in a discipline where I didn't really need to learn another language in order to operate and earn my living and do my work. So God bless you. Um, and I know that it is a challenge uh, coming from a variety of language backgrounds to write to the level uh, in English that's expected. But these wonderful folks, Justin and Siobhan, are here to help you. And the campus also has a number of other courses to support students in improving these skills. Okay. And uh, they are also offering a research writing uh, practicum a course you can sign up for, 698W. So it's a workshop format. and help you work on structuring documents and phrasing and so forth uh, and uh, uh, working through uh, writing. And there are a couple of testimonials there from some of our students. That was very helpful to them. Right. Uh, and these slides will be posted so you can go back through them and you don't have to remember the course number and all. Okay, um, now I'm nearing the end of the formal presentation, but one thing I want to note is um, if you are eligible, we re require you to apply for a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship. 
Now, eligibility uh, is more or less, uh, you have to be a US citizen or permanent resident of the US. So uh, this is not a requirement for our international students. Much as we value you, the National Science Foundation does not grant graduate research fellowships to international students. Now, there are two years of eligibility, your first year as a graduate student and your second, uh, but you can only apply once. So you can apply the first year or the second year. And the uh, graduate school that is of the campus, not just our college, <clears throat> has a terrific series of seminars and support to guide you through the process. And of course, our writing center that I just talked about can also help you with putting together you know, your fellowship application. <clears throat> and a faculty member that you're affiliated with should be able to give you feedback on your application as well. And I believe those are generally due in October, maybe early November timeframe. And this year they started something new. They have particular computer science topic areas that they're especially interested in that you can go look up. Okay. So some tips for staying happy and healthy in graduate school. Well, first off, obey all the COVID rules, but don't do this alone. Connect with other people. Isolation is not helpful. Make sure to get sleep and exercise and have a reasonable diet. Explore our area and all it has to offer. There's wonderful walking and biking trails and uh, various cultural things and such, uh, many of which will be more easy to access post-COVID, but still a lot of cool things and other students uh, uh, and staff can introduce you to them. Um, the Graduate Student Senate provides an excellent list of resources uh, to uh, help you explore life outside of academics. Uh, I'll just say uh, my family and I, my wife and I, uh, really love movies, film, and uh, you know, there's you know, your regular main run cinema over at the malls, but also, uh, again, probably mostly post-COVID, there's a great place in town called Amherst Cinema that show, that's one of the best art cinemas in the whole region of the United States. So, and it's right there for us. So there's lots of great things. So again, welcome. Getting a PhD isn't easy, but we're here to help. These slides will be available and we invite you to ask, reach out and ask questions at any time. And if you need an individual consultation, Eileen and I are happy to try to arrange that. And that ends my formal presentation. We've gone almost an hour, but plenty of time for questions. So do we have any questions that haven't been answered yet? Nope. Feel free to unmute and jump in. No need to be shy. How common is it for international students to be looking into uh, funding options from their own countries? Oh, gosh, um, I don't know. I'm not sure I've ever heard of that, uh, really. I mean, sometimes people come with a fellowship from their sending country. I, Eileen, you might know more about that because you track the funding a little more. Can you just repeat that part? Yeah, so um, how common is it for international students to seek out or like investigate research funding options from their own countries? Um, so a few students come in with like a Fulbright or, um, can I think of another one? Um, but it, it's not common. That's I see. Oh, I know yeah. we have students um, from, Turkey, I believe there's like a gov sometimes there's a government uh, fellowship that'll provide some mm -hmm. funding. So mm -hmm. I would say maybe one or two a year. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, I think we see the occasional student from uh, China with a Ch Chinese government fellowship or subsidy. Um, sometimes kind of regular ones, sometimes maybe if they were military. I don't know if we tend to see that so much, but I certainly am aware that it happens. I also know that it, that. Uh, whether we like it or not, our, our 
government is a little nervous about some of those uh, if they're military backed, but mm -hmm. uh, anyway. Um, other questions? There must be things you're wondering about. Okay, well, I, I hope this presentation has kind of gotten you a bit, uh, oh yes, Heidi Bauer Clapp. Yes, she is the person who uh, does a, leads all those NSF fellowship things, but also is, is great about uh, funding for international students. She's terrific in the uh, graduate school office. Um, I was gonna say, I hope that this presentation gets you a little bit set for your first few years heading up toward portfolio. Um, and then uh, Eileen, you're doing a Q&A next week, right? Yep, yep, yeah. just me. no faculty. Right, and so after you've had a chance to digest this and realize, oh, I really don't understand this, then you can come talk with Eileen and she can explain it to you. Um, that like the whole MS project synthesis project thing uh, is a little confusing. Uh, sometimes even the faculty get confused by it. Um, so it, it's something we, we do try to make sure you, you get a firm grasp of so you don't get uh, behind in your studies. Um, we don't emphasize in this initial presentation much about uh, sort of all the technical steps of forming a dissertation committee and doing the dissertation and all. I have a separate presentation I do for the students when they pass portfolio about how to do all that. If I told you now, you will have forgotten in three years anyway. And it would just overload you with information. Uh, but we do have, of course, we do have that information around. Oh, hi, Elliot. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, oh. I guess I have some silly question, but well, uh, how do you I would just say the silly question is the one you fail to ask, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how do we know uh, if we are actually in a MS, PhD, or only PhD track? Uh, Eileen can tell you. I think Spire should show it as well. It, it kind of shows it when I see it. It should, but it's sometimes off. So, if you earned a master's degree in the United States, then you can transition right into the PhD only program. Um, if your master's degree was earned outside of the United States, then you would start here earning a master's degree mm -hmm. while you're working toward your PhD. Yeah, that, that would be the usual. I'd say two little caveats of that. One is if your master's degree in the U.S. is in a different field, we would not necessarily automatically uh, qualify you for PhD only but it's a question you can ask. The admissions committee looks at the materials and makes an initial decision. So that's sort of where it comes from. But we are not allowed to give credit, if you will, for um, master's degrees achieved outside the United States, even if they're from places we know and respect, it's just a graduate school rule. But we can then uh, change your program later. Okay. So we, we're not able to receive credit, but I would, I mean, you could go for a, a PhD only track, right? Yes. Yeah. You can apply to switch tracks if you're not already on that track. Oh, okay. um, and in some cases you could say, you could just say, Hey, did you make a mistake? <laughs> um, or whatever. And they might, anyway, so that's something you can work with Eileen on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, and we do have, probably every year what a handful of students switch around with that, don't we, Eileen? We do, we have some that come in and start off just PhD only, and then they decide, sorry, small person walked by. Um, <laughs> and then they decide, you know what, I'm gonna earn a master's degree while I'm here, it, you know, for the resume, or maybe they're considering not finishing the PhD entirely, and they realize research wasn't really their their area and they had maybe a job offer or something. So we can switch that we can switch you from PhD only to MS PhD. And then you can either continue on right. and PhD or you could, you know, stop out with the best. Right. We can, we can switch that in either direction. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, if you decide you want to leave, we can switch you from 
well, not that, not that we really need to do it, but from MS, PhD to MS, really just complete the MS degree and leave and, you know, whatever. Yeah, okay. so there's all, there's all kinds of things that happens and works, works out. I mean, I, I remember um, years ago seeing a thing that said for all kinds of sort of top uh, qualifying things in different fields, uh, it was not unusual for maybe one third of the people who enter to complete. Actually, our completion rate's a lot higher than that. But, um, and then you say, well, what happens to the others? Well, I think in many cases, they're involved in it and they ultimately decide, no, this isn't really what I want to do. They're just kind of trying it out. So it's not, it's not what I would call failure, but it's more a success in learning something about yourself and what you really want to do. Uh, and that's fine, you know, that you know, we're here to help educate and that doesn't necessarily, that means to help you learn about yourself and what you want to do in life and to build your skills, whether that means getting the PhD degree or not. Sure. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Elliot, there is another question. Yeah. Um, what? Uh, I see it, independent study. Right. It? Okay. So, uh, you know, of course, normally, you know, we have what tens of courses we offer, you know, like operating systems, machine learning, theory of algorithms, et cetera, uh, from, you know, your basic graduate level, introductory graduate courses to more advanced topics. But some other sorts of things we offer, uh, you know, are seminars where maybe you uh, are reading papers from the literature. So it's not uh, an organized body of knowledge that would have a textbook or something. Um, but you're learning more at the edge of the field, but also uh, independent study. So that means a topic that you and your professor arrange between yourselves. Um, now, most often with an undergraduate, I've seen it as, oh, they want to go learn something that we don't offer a course on, and they just want to go learn about it. But the graduate level independent studies are usually around a research uh, question, a piece of research. So one way in which independent studies get used by students and faculty in our program is um, if you and a potential advisor are kind of testing the water, do you want to work together? Then you may come up with, say, a one semester project, research project to work on together. You do as an independent study and you get three credits for it. Yeah, great. Thanks for reminding us to read the questions out loud. How do you pass an independent study? Um, the professor decides that you've done what was set out to do. Now, when you uh, request an independent study, there's an online form. Uh, we just moved this all online in the last few weeks, really. And there might still be a little bit of systems bugs to get worked out, but it seems to be working pretty well. Anyway, you fill in a form, and one part of that is, uh, what uh, the requirement of what you're going to be evaluated on, the evaluation criteria, so that you and your advisor know what it is that's going to be looked at to determine your grade. And then the, the instructor, the advisor for that, I mean, usually it's your own advisor, but whoever you're, whatever faculty member you're doing the independent study with will determine the grade. And then uh, we enter it. Okay, question. I switched from master's program to MS PhD, but my expected graduation term on Spire still summer 2022. Is that an error? Um, my guess is, yeah, it probably hasn't been updated yet. Does that sound right, Eileen? The expected graduation date? No, uh, well, yes and no. Um, when you're in the MS PhD program, the graduate school considers it two academic plans. So your master's academic plan will keep that same four year um, statute of limitations. Then if you click on your other plan, it'll have your PhD and, you know, and it'll have a different end term. So you're- uh, Okay, yeah. right, okay. So, so I think the answer to the question then is they're still expecting you to complete your MS in 2022, at least they're hoping you are, um, but your PhD timeline will be longer than that. Right. Um, hey, uh, on the same lines, 
uh-huh. we will be getting, I'm an MS PhD student and I'm, my understanding is we'll be getting our MS as we complete our PhD. And yes. the question is, mm-hmm. is the MS requirement for MS PhD students the same as MS only students? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, the number of credits is the same. Uh, MS only students are not required to do an MS project. The PhD track students are. Uh, For a PhD student, the core courses all have to be the 600 level and above and come from our, some of them need to come from our short lists and such. Whereas for MS only students, uh, 500 level cores work. I think those are the key differences. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, could we see like the synthesis project that have been done previously? Um, you'd have to ask uh, students to share them with you. Um, uh, for one thing, they don't really file them with us exactly. I mean, sometimes we have the reports as part of their portfolio, um, but uh, they're not public documents that we can share. I can add. Uh, yeah, yeah, but Eileen or someone might be able to say, here are some pairings of topics that have happened or that sort of thing. Yeah, go ahead, Eileen. Yeah, and um, I, I'll have a workshop for people who want to ask, come and ask questions when it's time to, or it's getting close to being time to submit your synthesis. And I'm hoping that we'll have some examples um, to show students a little bit about what, what they look like. Um, to me, they just look like short papers. And, uh, but, but it would be nice to see some different topics to show you and, and give you some ideas, but you don't have to worry about that yet. So um, yeah. when it gets a little closer, you can ask. I would, I would say the uh, synthesis project reports indeed are often structured similarly to a workshop or conference paper. In fact, uh, probably at least half of them, about half anyway, do end up being submitted for publication. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, we we have not put together any sort of repository of them. Um, I guess Eileen's going to start collecting some that can be used as examples, and that'll be great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, so I, I'll just say some of the ones that I've been involved in involve uh, synthesis between machine learning and systems areas. Um, in part because I've done work that involves say machine learning with compilers or with uh, machine learning to analyze cache mistraces or things like that. But also things uh, that go between some of the systems work I do and uh, theory like machine check proofs of certain interesting systems things. Um, It goes, well, it's all over the space, all kinds of things. It's very common to see machine learning plus something in our college because there's so much machine learning going on, but certainly uh, there's lots of syntheses that don't involve machine learning. Any other questions out there right now? Well, I really appreciate everybody coming. I know probably for some of you, uh, it's uh, into your evening, maybe even pretty late on Thursday night in uh, East or South Asia. Uh, So we appreciate your coming and coming with your questions. And uh, we do look forward to seeing you in person as soon as that's safe and healthy. Um, Eileen, do you have anything else to add? No. No, ah, so some happen. courses in five colleges, which I'm interested in, do you have to wait? Um, I don't. Well, I don't know when the other colleges started. Uh, they usually start earlier than UMass, but UMass started two weeks earlier than it usually does this year. But uh, Eileen is right that if you're interested in a five college course, now by five colleges, we mean at Amherst College, Hampshire College, Mount Holyoke College or Smith College, there's a collaboration of those colleges which are near us with UMass. 
where you can cross register without paying tuition and such. Um, so uh, I don't know exactly when they started, but I would say you need to get on it. Um, so as Eileen says, you can send her an email and she can try to help you with that. And I, I have admitted at least one five college student into my compiler class. So it happens in both ways. Great question. Okay. Um, so Eileen, uh, could you say again when your Q&A is next week so everybody knows? Oh, sure. Put me on the spot. Uh, it is uh, next Thursday at 10 a.m. Yeah. Okay. Thursday at 10 a.m. Eastern time. And like I said, it's just me, no faculty. So we can, you know, we can be a little bit more laid back about our questions. <laughs> and it's not going to be recorded. Yeah, and don't, don't worry, I wasn't judging anyway. <laughs> you don't have to be afraid of me. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'm thrilled that there's so many people here from around the yeah. world. Yeah, it was a wonderful turnout. Thank you for coming. Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and leave the meeting now. Um, if there's anything you wanted to ask Eileen without me here, maybe she'll stick around for a minute. Otherwise you can talk with her next week and you can always get in touch with me, make an appointment, whatever. Oh, uh, one quick comment. If you have forms that need a signature, don't send them directly to me. Give them to Eileen and Malika. Often they can actually sign for me. And if they can't, they'll make the arrangements with me to get them signed uh, promptly. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, bye-bye. Right. Okay. I'll be here for a minute if anybody has a question. Otherwise, I know you're all tired <laughs> or ready to go to sleep wherever you're from. Uh, I have one question for the independent study. Yeah. yeah. When is the deadline for, for us to submit the form to the college? Sure. So for uh, graduate students, we don't actually have a deadline because so often projects are developed in the middle of the semester. Typically, you're going to submit the form before ad drop um, just for convenience and enrollment and things like that. Um, but if in October you're working with your advisor on a project and he says or she says, oh, you could do this for credit, then you can certainly submit the form and we'll go through the process. So anytime is fine. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And I just I'll just say, you know, with with we've tried to put everything online so that we're not emailing documents. We used to do things like that before this happened. And so most everything is online and should be accessible to everyone. But if you're having any trouble filling out any of the online forms, just send me an email. Um, but Malika is not here cause she's having some, she was having some reactions to allergies. We have a lot of pollen and things right now. So, but um, Malika is fantastic and she'll, send you if you need a letter or a form or anything like that. So either one of us can help you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Or if you think of something, I'll be here next. Uh, I think I sent you the link. Well, it's on the orientation page. I Yeah, it is for next Thursday. If you think of other things, what time is it now where you are? It's 10 PM. Oh, okay. So that's not bad. So 10 AM is a good time. Okay. Okay, good. I'll remember that. Great. Anybody else have any questions? Wish I could see everybody. You're all shy. <laughs> uh, I have a quick question about so 890T. I think I have um, a problem to being enrolled because the class is full. It is full, but it'll be offered again next fall. So you can, um, oh, you can certainly, yeah, you can certainly, you know. Because take I'm a TA this semester, so. I know. So the the person that's instructing it is 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 new to the class, and so we didn't want to over enroll it. We've over enrolled it in the past when we had a more experienced instructor, um, but she didn't want to go too high with the numbers. So, um, so it's okay. You can take it next fall. You're you're not you know going against any rules or anything. Oh, okay. Okay. Plus you've been around, so you you know you have an idea about things, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Yeah, I have one question. 
uh, is the drop deadline for uh, 890T same as the other graduate courses? Um, it is, but if you're gonna drop it, you gotta just email Malika and let her know that if you plan to drop it, because then the thing is somebody else could take that spot because she has a wait list. Yeah, sure. That helps a lot. Yeah.